Welcome to this video in the Cumulus Cycles JavaScript playlist. In this tutorial, we'll look at JavaScript event handling. In client-side JavaScript, which is JavaScript that's executed in the browser, events are things that happen to HTML elements on a web page. For example, when the web page completes loading, or when a user enters text into an input field, or clicks a submit button on a form. And when these things, or as they are properly referred to as events, happen, JavaScript can be used to react to them. Before moving on, I want to draw your attention to the code on this page. Here, they're adding an event attribute directly into the HTML element and specifying the JavaScript code to be executed. However, this implementation is not the modern way of adding JavaScript in your web pages. The proper way to implement event handling in JavaScript is to bind event listeners to the HTML elements using the add event listener method, as in this example. Here, they're using JavaScript to go to the document, the DOM, get the element where the ID is my button, and then they bind the add event listener to that element and listen for the click event. When the click event happens on this element, they call a function display date. So let's take a look at the code. In the HTML, they have a button with an ID of my button and a paragraph tag with an ID of demo. The JavaScript, as we saw, goes to the DOM to get the element where the ID is my button. They then bind the add event listener and listen for the click event. When the button is clicked, they call the display date function. And the display date function goes to the DOM to get the element where the ID is demo, that's the paragraph, and sets its inner HTML property equal to calling the JavaScript date method and returning the value. So if we click the try it button, we see the date is displayed in the paragraph with the ID of demo. As you can see on this page, there are many events which JavaScript can listen for and take action on. Let's examine a few. The on blur event occurs when an object or an HTML element loses focus. We see there's an HTML input element with the ID of fname. In the JavaScript, they get the element with the ID of fname, add an event listener for the blur event, and then call the myFunction function. myFunction displays a JavaScript alert indicating that the input field has lost focus. So if I put the focus of the cursor into the input field and type, and then either tab or click outside of the box so that the focus is no longer in the input field, that will trigger the blur event and the function will be executed. The click event, as we saw earlier, occurs when a user clicks on an HTML element. The on focus event occurs when an HTML element gets the focus of the cursor. So in this example, again, they have an input field with an ID of F name, and they bind the add event listener listening for the focus event and then call my function. When the element with the ID of F name gets focus, it changes the background color for the element style to red. So this time when I click into the field, we see the element's background color is changed. The input event occurs when an element gets input from the user, so when I enter text into the text field. The key down event occurs when the user is typing or pressing down on a key on the keyboard. The key up event is fired when the user releases the key on the keyboard. And there are several events related to the mouse actions. The resize event is fired when the user resizes the browser window. And as we've seen in prior videos, the submit event occurs when the user submits a form. Let's take a look at another example. Here, I've created an HTML button element and given it an ID of button. There's a spam with an ID of message that's currently equal to an empty space, a spam with an ID of single click, which indicates that the button has been single clicked zero times, and then a button with an ID of reset. And when we execute this JS fiddle, we see the HTML displayed in the pane in the lower right. In the JavaScript, I've created variables to hold the HTML elements and a variable to hold the value of the single click counter. The variable name button is equal to the element with the ID of button, which is the button with the text of click me. I've bound several event listeners to the button element. One to listen for the mouse over event, which when that happens, it executes this anonymous function, setting the message elements in our HTML equal to the mouse cursor is over the button. So if I move my cursor over the button, 
we see the text, the mouse cursor is over the button is displayed. And if I move out, the text goes away. And that's due to the mouse out event listener on the button, which sets the inner HTML of the message equal to an empty string. When the click event listener is fired on the button, the anonymous function executes and it adds one to the single click count, takes that value and displays it in the inner HTML of the single click. So if I click the button, we now see that the button has been clicked one time. And if I click it a few more times, each time the click count is incremented. Finally, I've bound a click event listener to the reset button, which will reset the single click count to zero and then set the inner HTML property of the single click equal to the reset value of zero for the counter. So if I click the reset button, the counter goes back to zero. Let's take a look at another example. This is a web page which clearly has a simple registration form. When the page loads, the focus of the cursor is in the username input field. If I click outside of the username field, which will trigger the on blur event, I get a message that the username is required. So I'll enter the username. And when the on blur event fires, because the username field has a value in it, the error message goes away. If I try and register without entering a password, I get the standard HTML validation error, which tells me I need to fill out the field. So I'll enter password for a password. Again, if I try and register, I'll be prompted to enter the password confirmation. This time I'll enter pass and try and register. And I get an error message that the passwords must match. So I'll enter password, register, and I get a message that my registration has been confirmed and the form is reset. If I enter values in the form fields and click the clear button, the form is reset and the focus of the cursor is put back into the username field. Now let's jump over to VS Code and see how this is implemented. Looking at the HTML, we see we have a form element with an ID of the form, an input element with the ID of username, an input with the ID of password, an input with the ID of confirm, so that we can confirm that the passwords match, an input for the email, an input for the phone, an input type number for the age with min and max values set for those attributes, an input type of reset, which will reset the form, and an input type submit, which will submit the form. And then a span with an ID of message where we can display error message if the form isn't completed properly. Jumping over to the JavaScript, I've created variables to hold the form elements, getting them by going to the DOM and finding the elements by their IDs. In the window on load function, I've declared a function named valid, which we'll use to validate if the password entered matches the confirmation password, which was entered. Then I've bound event listeners to the HTML elements. The username field has an event listener for the blur event. So when the user tabs out of or clicks out of the username field, I'll check to see if the value they entered into the field and trimming it is equal to an empty string. And if it is, I'll set the inner HTML of the error message span to indicate that the username is required. And then I'll call this focus to set the cursor focus into this element, which is the username. If the user did enter a valid value, I'll clear the error message span. There's an input event listener on the age element, which will check this element, so the age element's validity, to see if it's valid. And that will use the min and max attribute values to see if the value that the user entered is within the appropriate range. If the element's validity range overflow is true, then the value that the user entered is too high. Else, if this element's validity range underflow is true, then the value they entered is too low. Again, the range overflow and range underflow are determined based on the validity of the values in the min and max attributes. There's a submit event listener bound to the form, and the second parameter passed into the submit event handler is a function passing a parameter, which is the event. And in this case, the event is the form submission when I'm calling prevent default on that form submission event. Because I don't want the form to reload, I don't want it to go to another page, I wanna do all the JavaScript validation on this page, stay here, and then just display a message to the user saying that the registration was successful or display an error message if the form wasn't completed properly. So after I prevent the default behavior, I call the valid function to see if the data that the user entered is valid. And if the valid function returns true, then I'll just pop up that alert saying that the registration is confirmed. I'll set the inner HTML of the message span to an empty string to clear it. And then I'll call this element, so the form elements reset method, which is bound to the event listener on the form. So when this reset is called from the submit handler, 
I take the focus of the cursor and put it into the username field. Now, this is also triggered if the user clicks the reset button because the reset button is an input type of reset inside of the form. So when that button is clicked, it resets the form and the focus of the cursor is put in the username field. The one function that we didn't look at here is the valid function. So we'll scroll up and declare a variable is valid and set it to true and then check to see if the value that the user entered into password field is not equal to the value the user entered into the confirmation field then we'll display the error message that the passwords must match clear out the value in the confirmation field and put the focus of the cursor into the confirmation field so the user could re-enter the confirmation i'll set is valid to false and return the value so by default, is valid is true. It will only return false if the password and confirmation value didn't match. So in this example, we've seen the blur event listener bound to an input field. We've seen the input event listener bound to an input field of type number, the submit event handler bound to the form, and the reset event handler bound to the form. When I did the demo of the form, I didn't show you the example of the input listener bound to the age field and what happens when the validity check is run. So I'll jump back over to the browser, go over to the age field, and by default, the minimum value is 18. I can't go under it. And if we go back to the HTML, we'll see that the maximum value is 50. If I try and change this by manually typing in, we'll see that the age is too low. Or if I enter 55, the age is too high. So that validation is being triggered on the input into the age element. So that was an overview of JavaScript events, the add event listener method, and an example of an implementation of some event handling. I'd encourage you to read through the HTML DOM events page on W3Schools and try to add event listeners to HTML elements and practice triggering and catching the JavaScript events. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, and I also hope to see you in another video on the Cumulus Cycles channel.